So, realizing ahead of time that this is going to be a lengthy video, what I'm going to do is divide it up into sections. I'll include time codes for those sections in the description below for those who may not be interested in one section, but might be interested in another. Now, I'd love it if you watched the whole video, but time codes are definitely available for those with shorter attention spans. The four sections I'm going to cover in this video are my early predictions of Fallout 76, a deeper trailer analysis with secret symbols and clues, my evolved predictions, and then take a look at some of the mysterious curiosities and intriguing landmarks that might be explorable in the map region. So, thanks for joining me here on The Schooled Zone. Welcome if you're new. Before we get into it, I apologize my voice sounds a bit raspy. I'm doing my best to make it not sound that way, but I've been basically working on this video every day after work since the trailer came out, into the wee hours, and only getting a few hours of sleep. Now, if you are new to the channel, my voice is usually much smoother when I'm well rested and all. I feel like I'm back in college right now, working on a midterm project, pulling all-nighters this week. <laughs> but I wanted to get this out before E3, so it'd be most relevant. All right, so let's start with my early predictions. And the reason this might be interesting is because it'll give you a sense of my success rate in forecasting this next Fallout game and how credible my other predictions might be. As many of you know, because of my day job, I'm not able to put out daily content yet, or even videos every other day for that matter. If I'm lucky, I can get out two to three videos in a week. Hopefully that'll soon change as the channel continues to grow and I get to leave my day job in the dust. But if I was able to crank out videos faster, then some of my predictions would have been better documented as proof. But I'll be completely honest with you about my thought process here. So let's start with the very early rumors of the Starfield game. It seems like eons ago now, but for a few months, all the way up until just a couple of weeks ago, many were predicting in the gamer news arena that there would be a space-themed RPG released from Bethesda this year. This was based on the name Starfield being bandied about, as well as indications a trademark was filed by Bethesda several years ago. This is never something I bought into. Starfield seemed like a code word to me to throw off the scent of potential leaks. You see, there was a pretty startling set of leaks Bethesda endured as it neared the release of Fallout 4. And there are very legitimate reasons why media companies try to prevent leaks as well as use code words. They're not just doing it for the drama or to emulate military secrecy, which obviously uses Operation Code Words for reasons of national security. First of all, the use of code words for projects didn't start with gaming companies. Film companies have been using code words for years. Some of the most famous examples include Star Beast, Project 880, A Boy's Life, Changing Seasons, Blue Harvest, and Planet Ice. And here are what the actual films were. Wild, huh? Now, why do film companies do this? Well, for a few reasons, actually. For one, safety. They often have to film scenes outside of a studio lot, and they need a way to both redirect cast and crew to the set location, as well as distract tourists and paparazzi. I live in LA, and I often see these fluorescent posters taped to street signs that might say something obscure like heron with like an arrow pointing a certain direction, instead of Avengers. And then they'll tell the cast and crew to look for signs leading to the parking lot labeled heron. If they just wrote Avengers, on the sign with an arrow, the set location would get flooded by people looking to get a glimpse of their favorite actors or a clue that they could then leak online. It would be madness and it would pretty much shut down the shoot. The other reason is to prevent rumors from ruining their marketing plans. Blockbuster films and AAA games have enormous budgets. Their entire enterprise is based on stellar sales figures for a release right out of the gate. There have been some major movies that flop precisely because rumors swirled about flaws in the movie that sometimes were never true. Some of that taint never washed is off and the studio never recovers its investment. So they have to hold their cards very close to their chest until just the right time to let the cat out of the bag. I mean, if you've been following the news, look how much crazy rumors and stuff have, have like gotten people upset and Bethesda hasn't even released barely any clues up until the teaser trailer. Now that's not to say that Bethesda won't try and build a spacefaring RPG in the future. I would actually welcome that if it were done right. But I do think many of the early leaks about a Starfield game were to throw off the scent of gaming journalists and may have even been propagated by the marketing team at Bethesda themselves. Look how insanely caught off guard we all were by news of a Fallout game before another Elder Scrolls game. Classic distract and divert strategy. And it worked like a charm. In fact, if you take a look at the images of the Fallout 76 billboard that's going up near the Los Angeles Convention Center where E3 is taking place, you can even see a bit of a Starfield clue. Now that's obviously supposed to be dust falling down from the door, then they're not actually stepping out from space. But clearly it was intentionally painted into the image as a sort of a wink and a nod. 
Some might even say a bit of lighthearted trolling. One of the things I love about Bethesda is that they know the power of symbolism. Not everything, of course, but nearly everything they put in their games or marketing materials is done with highly conscious intent. You know what I mean? I mean, in my humble opinion, they're one of the most, what's the word I'm looking for here? Cerebral, maybe? They're one of the most cerebral gaming companies out there. And that's why I dig their games so much. They don't dumb anything down. We'll go into more detail on that later in the video. Oh, and there is precedent for code names with Bethesda too. Fallout 4's early code name was the Institute, and the Institute ended up being a major organization in the game as well as a nod to MIT. So for that prediction, I'm gonna tentatively mark that down with a happy face. However, if you'd asked me where the next Fallout game would take place, I would have been wrong. Surmising that Starfield was a code word, I did a little digging on a map for references to Starfield a couple of months ago. And there's a place in Missouri called Starfield. It's near Kansas City. So my prediction about where Fallout 5 would have taken place was Kansas City with areas of Chicago and St. Louis within the map region or part of DLCs. This would have coordinated perfectly with the rogue faction of the Brotherhood of Steel based out of Chicago, which would have been kind of a cool inclusion. Now that we've seen the teaser trailer though and heard the John Denver song about West Virginia and been given the name Vault 76, which according to lore is based near DC, my prediction on that would have been totally wrong. So for that prediction, I'm marking that down with a sad face. On the other hand, if you'd asked me where the majority of the game would take place and the kind of landscape we'd be looking at, I would have told you that if it was based mostly in the region between Kansas City and St. Louis, with Chicago to the northeast, then we would have been mostly exploring in a very rural countryside map around Missouri and Illinois with limited access to urban environments. Although I can't confirm that, I do think that's going to be the case with Fallout 76. And besides just the map, there was also another reason why I thought it would focus on a rural environment, and that's because of what I call the zeitgeist. Zeitgeist is a German adopted word that literally means the spirit of the times, but it has come to imply trends that appear in world history. Because Bethesda Game Studios is an American-based company, they're just as susceptible to the political headwinds that the rest of Americans are. And in the years leading up to and including the presidential election of 2016, there was a lot of emphasis placed on what the news media calls Middle America, you know, or flyover country or the heartland. Various political coalitions did a very good job of painting the people that live in rural and suburban areas of this region of the United States as, you know, the forgotten people or the folks outside the Beltway or God-fearing folk. Now, I've lived parts of my life in the South and the Midwest, and I can tell you, for those who may be watching this other parts of the world, that there are plenty of very sophisticated people that live in these central states. But you wouldn't necessarily get that impression if you listen to politicians as each side of the aisle tries to caricature residents in that region for their own political advantage. But nevertheless, the magnifying glass was pointed there and it became part of the zeitgeist. As a result, media started shifting towards appealing to the people of this demographic, with new shows on TV, movies, and even other video games. A great example of this was Ubisoft's decision to locate their most recent Far Cry game in Montana, where both the enemies and allies in-game consist of country folk, you know, who cling to their guns and their religion, so to speak. It's an awesome game, by the way, that I'm currently featuring on my Patreon page if you want to go check it out. But getting back to my point, it makes perfect sense that Fallout 76 might also place an emphasis on the rural element of American life this time to stand as a stark contrast to their previous coastal environments. Obsidian, the makers of Fallout New Vegas, has a property they're working on called Project Indiana. Now we've learned that they're not involved with Bethesda anymore, but Indiana is squarely in the heartland, and Bethesda bought out a studio in Texas, which is also in the heartland, and they're the ones who helped develop Fallout 76. So as to whether Fallout 76 is gonna have a rural folksy vibe, well, the jury's still out on that, but it's definitely leaning that way. So I'm gonna give that prediction of mine a maybe face for now. The next prediction I made was about companions in the game. For a while now, I've been thinking about what the companion system would look like in Fallout 5. As for the settlement building system in the next game, there was only one way for it to go, and that was up. Meaning, keep it and improve it. But what about companions? There were a lot of different directions the game could go when it came to companions. My prediction was that they'd make it so that if you wanted an expanse of companions, you'd have to hook up with another player, or even a squad of players in real life. My prediction was reinforced by the way Far Cry 5 handled it. In Far Cry 5, you can pick up companions up to two simultaneous companions to be exact, but you can also bring on companions that are real life friends. This has evolved the term co-op gameplay, which traditionally used to mean two or more people sitting in a room together 
playing from the same console to now a limited or hybrid form of multiplayer where you and another player can play remotely but together at the same time within the same saved game environment, you know, without involving everyone on a server. Then almost out of nowhere, there was a sort of mass hysteria about the next Fallout game being an MMO or strictly multiplayer game. I think that came from an early Twitter leak or something, I'm not sure, but it's now been confirmed by several sources that there is going to be some form of multiplayer or co-op element to the game. So for that prediction, I'm marking that down as a happy face. Now, so far, all these predictions I made to myself were months ago, but the last prediction I made came after seeing the colorized Please Stand By screenshot from the Bethesda Twitch account the day before the teaser trailer released. Now, part of the reason I'm including these predictions of mine is because I went to work immediately on a video about the next Fallout game, not thinking they would actually release the teaser trailer the very next day. I thought it would come out, you know, weeks later, or at least in the week leading up to E3, which would have been this week. My video would have had all these predictions, including the last one based on the Twitch stream. But Bethesda did release the video the next day, and that changed the entirety of my video. So I had to scrap that video and repurpose it into what we have here. But we haven't gotten the answer to my next prediction, so I'm going to include it. When people saw that colorized Please Stand By screen, all kinds of theories were rushed out. You know, things like this proves it's a Fallout 3 remaster, or this proves it's an MMO-only game, or, you know, what have you. My prediction immediately went to a new Fallout 4 game, which at the time I would have said was Fallout 5. But I also predicted a different time period, not in the sense of an in-game time. We know now that the game takes place as kind of a prequel of sorts to the previous games. I would not have guessed that. No, what I mean is that it was going to take place in a different cultural and aesthetic time period. And here's what I mean by that. In the previous Fallout games, up to and primarily Fallout 3, the cultural and aesthetic vibe revolved around the 1950s. In Fallout New Vegas, we saw a slight shift to the late 50s, early 60s. And then in Fallout 4, the shift moved further further towards a mid to late 60s vibe. Again, I'm talking purely from a cultural and aesthetic standpoint, not an in-game timeline. When I saw the colorized Please Stand By screen, I immediately recognized that as a shift towards and into the look and feel of the 1970s. This was further reinforced by actually seeing a colorized TV in the teaser trailer and hearing the song Country Roads. By the way, I say colorized in this context instead of just color to imply the early vacuum tube models instead of the full digital color models we see today. Now, although very expensive colorized TVs existed before the 1970s, it wasn't until the early to mid 70s that color TVs were a common household item. You know, it's like saying, sure, commercial mobile phones existed in the 1980s, but seriously, most people didn't get their first cell phone until the late 90s or early 2000s and beyond, of course. Also, John Denver didn't release his song Country Roads until 1971. There are some other clues we'll get into later in the video, but personally, I think there's going to be a leaning towards a more cultural and aesthetic 1970s vibe in Fallout 76, not to mention the vault name 76. But since I have no hard proof of that, I'll give that prediction the maybe face for now. So as you can see, I got one completely wrong, a few maybes, and a few solid rights. Allegedly. We won't know for sure until after E3. Or maybe even longer, depending on how many questions get answered during their showcase. Anyway, I wanted to lay those out for you because they're kind of interesting, and also to give you a sort of credibility index as we go into the next section of the video, which is taking a deep dive into the teaser trailer from a symbolism and trivia point of view. After all, educating you guys with cool factoids is the specialty of the school zone. Oh man, my voice is killing me, killing me, but I'm going to make it through this because it's fun stuff. So the first thing we see is a shot of the Pip-Boy on the nightstand. It's an older style Pip-Boy with the visible vacuum tubes that a lot of people have called the Pip-Boy 2000. It's not actually a Pip-Boy 2000, which first appeared in the original Fallout game. Skipping ahead to the shot of the character putting on his forearm, we can freeze the frame, flip it upside down, and enhance the image to see that it's called a Pip-Boy 2000 Mark VI. I'm not sure why they didn't just call it a Pip-Boy 2600 or something, because there's a jump from 2000 to 3000. But anyway, it's the first clue meant to let you know that this is going to be a prequel. The next clue comes a moment later as we pan out and see the date on the Pip-Boy, October 27, 2102. That's only 25 years after the bombs drop instead of a couple hundred years like Fallout 4. That date has some significance too, which we'll get back to more later in the video. So let's keep going. Unstoppable's comic on the nightstand. If we take a closer look at this issue, it appears to be the issue called Kamikaze versus Manta Man. Now, Manta Man is not a character we've seen much of in the Fallout games so far. You know, we, we've seen the, the burnt ones, but you can't really read them. He's sort of based on Aquaman. Now, is that a clue that we might see some underwater action of some sort in Fallout 76? 
The Potomac River does run from an area in West Virginia called the Potomac Highlands down to the Chesapeake Bay in the D.C. area. From all estimations, the game is pretty much going to be centered on the Potomac Highlands. So we'll see where that leads. But before we get too much further, the song. Almost heaven, West Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountains, Shenandoah. The song playing is Take Me Home Country Roads by John Denver. It was written by a couple other guys, but you know, he, he helped and published it. And it was released in 1971 and has become an iconic song of pride for West Virginia. Now here's the thing. If the game was gonna exclusively take place in the DC area of Virginia, there are plenty of other songs they could have used about Virginia. A few that come to mind are Carry Me Back to Old Virginia by Jerry Lee Lewis from 1963 or maybe Down in Virginia by Jimmy Reed from 1958. Other songs are even in the public domain. They wouldn't have even had to pay for licensing, but they chose this song for a reason. While Vault 76 may be closer to the DC area, which is alluded to in Fallout 3, I think a lot of the game will actually take place in the area of West Virginia, not too far from DC, called the Eastern Panhandle. The other reason I think they chose this song is what I mentioned earlier about it being specifically a 1970s song, instead of a 40s, 50s, or 60s song. I'm hard pressed to think of any other soundtrack song in Fallout 4 that came from the 1970s. Now, I could be wrong about that, but the song from the Fallout 4 teaser trailer, for example, was an Ink Spot song from the 1940s. The song also mentions the Shenandoah River, which is an offshoot of the Potomac River, and the Blue Ridge Mountains, which is a subsection of the Appalachian Mountains. Both the Shenandoah River and the Blue Ridge Mountains are part of that West Virginia Panhandle region I mentioned. Now, I'm not sure which came first for the developers, the idea of using Vault 76 or using this song, but it must have been a light bulb over the head kind of moment when the two came together. So let's keep going. Okay, stop. Lots to analyze in this set of frames. First of all, jangles, nothing new there. But if we continue under the assumption that Bethesda loves adding Easter eggs and story clues via symbolism, then there are a few things I noticed about this. Now, this is just my opinion, but the face of the doll kind of looks a little dark and lifeless to me. Not like you saw him in Fallout 4, you know, that's, you know, we wouldn't be degrading in video quality, we'd be improving in video quality. It's also not merely just tossed on the bed. It's kind of lying on the bed in such a way that reminds me of a child. Many people theorize that stuffed animals in the game are supposed to represent children sometimes. Could we see a story arc where the main character's child has died and he's out to exact revenge? Would an adult male we see in the trailer otherwise sleep with a large toy like that? I mean, okay, maybe. <laughs> if it's a boy's room, though, and not the main character's room, why would there be a fedora in golf clubs? Now, maybe I'm reading into this too much, but it might be a story clue. Now, under the bed, we see some interesting things. First of all, that's not a new kind of first aid kit, as some have suggested. As I do a little graphic enhancement magic, you can see it's most likely the red toolbox from Fallout 4. We also have the baseball, a baseball glove, and a pocket watch, also seen in Fallout 4. But we do have a few new things. First of all, we can see some binoculars. If that's going to be a usable item in Fallout 76, that would be awesome. But that would also be a clue to another interesting feature. Faster long distance loading times. That probably means a better game engine. Again, I'm just taking educated guesses here, but how cool would that be? I mean, binoculars are a staple of plenty other adventure games. Why never Fallout? We have the recon scope in Fallout 4, but binoculars would have a much higher magnification index. The next interesting thing we see is a box with two spikes. I don't think this is some kind of new weapon as some have suggested. As cool as a crossbow would be as a silent weapon in the game, that would be pretty awesome because I love stealth characters. But here's what I think it is. I think it's a walkie-talkie. To me, it looks like a 60s or 70s style walkie-talkie, which were very big and blocky like that, with what are called doublets or dipole antennas. Why would there be a walkie-talkie in the game? Well, might we need a way to communicate with companions or squad mates that are beyond speaking distance? Hmm? <laughs> Now the yellow thing I think is just some confetti and that purple thing I think is a slipper, which we also see again here. But if we look closely, there's another comic under the walkie-talkie. If I flip the image and enhance it further, I think this is Grognak number one called Blood on the Harp. I'm not sure if there's any significance there, so I'll just keep going, but it looks like some old comic faves are back. We also have a possible new perk magazine called Scout's Life. We can see a better shot of it later in the video. This is obviously a reference to the Boy Scouts of America, which are known for their camping skills and outdoor survival training. So we could take a guess at what some of the new perks in the game might entail. Lastly, before we leave this area for the next scene, we have a new painting on the wall. It looks to be an old cluster of red brick buildings. 
There are a lot of old red brick buildings in the West Virginia area, but what comes to mind when I see this is something that I'll be going into more detail later in the video, and that's a coal mining complex. Interesting stuff. Let's keep going. Now, this frame has gotten a lot of attention in the gamersphere because it's a new multiplayer Unstoppables game. Specifically, it's called the Unstoppables Shindig. A shindig is slang for a rowdy party, but it's a term with a more rural vibe from the southern states. You know, shindigs, hoedowns, hootenannies. <laughs> All has that sort of hee-haw vibe, which was an American TV show about country western life right around the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s. We also have a new type of beer. Looks like it might say oak house lager or possibly oak holler. Holler is a way that people in the Appalachian region of America call a hollow, which is like a little valley with a dried up stream. They sort of morphed hollow into meaning like you have to holler across the valley to get in touch with your neighbors. So I'm guessing it's one of those two, house or holler. That, along with the guitar and harmonica, reinforces the folksy vibe, you know? Notice there's some kind of new horn creature in the game. You know, it's interesting, and it may be something to replace the rad stags, you know? Perhaps a rad elk? Elks are known to inhabit the West Virginia mountains. We do see a bunch more games on the shelf. With a closer look, we can see the blast radius, of course, and a game that looks like it might be called Bad Poker or Rad Poker. And then a game here, which I personally think is called Autopsy. It's very hard to read, but the side of the game looks like it says, figure out what the alien is made of faster than all your opponents. Now, make a mental note of that for later in the video. There's another game we see here. It's very difficult to read the text, but this is where being a professional graphic designer for my day job helps out a little bit. If I do some more enhancement magic, we can see the side of the box says, a three-dimensional game. Cooperate with your friends to build a working trap to catch the communists. Once it's built, players turn against each other. Now attempt to trap the communist-shaped game pieces and catch your commie friend. Now that is very interesting. First of all, I do think that's a bit of a clue that building things is going to be a feature of the game, which is awesome for the no mod shop glass. But a lot of people are going to immediately jump to the conclusion about the second part that talks about players turning against each other and assume that means some sort of Rust or Arc Evolve style defend your turf survival game. My gut instinct tells me that we should put that in the wait and see category, not get ahead of our skis on that one. As fun as all this theorizing is to do here, it's still just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. <laughs> I couldn't help myself there. Props to Bat Bat. Another interesting thing we see is a bird cage. To me, this is a reference to the phrase canary in a coal mine. West Virginia is known as coal country, and miners used to take canaries in cages like that into coal mines to help detect early signs of carbon monoxide poisoning, since canaries are more susceptible to the immediate effects than humans, and it would give miners a little bit of a head start to get out of that area. The poster here says tricentennial. That means a span of 300 years. Back in 1976, the United States celebrated the Bicentennial, which was 200 years after the Declaration of Independence. So in 2076, they would have celebrated 300 years after the American Revolution. Don't know if there's more to it than that here other than a marketing scheme by vault -Tec. so we'll just keep moving. We have some kind of chipmunk or a groundhog mascot on the shelf. Some people have said it's a squirrel. I think it might be a groundhog, actually, because... It looks like the mascot for a minor league baseball team called the Gwinnett Braves, which used to be based out of Richmond, Virginia. They've since moved to Atlanta and are called the Stripers now. But you know, sometimes the developers throw things in the game based on something an employee had a close connection to. That's how they decided on Boston as the location of Fallout 4, by the way. Their lead designer, Emil something, forget his last name, but he was from Boston. So maybe this time one of the game developers had a connection to the Richmond Braves. Yeah, you never know. Okay, we'll come back to what the TV is saying. First, let's check out this frame because there's some interesting things going on here. First of all, miniaturized Nuka-Cola gear, which looks fun for settlement decoration, as well as robot models that we've seen in Fallout 4, but also a Vault Boy model. Very cool. My mind is just racing about all the building possibilities here. On the right side, another robot model and what looks like maybe a bobby pin box behind it. In the center, we have a chessboard and some San Francisco sunlights, I believe. We can see that Scout's Life mag I mentioned earlier. Another one here. 
Now here's where it gets more interesting. We have another possible perk magazine called Backwoodsman. Clearly another indication that outdoor survival skills are going to play a big part in the game. I have a theory that there might be some of the realistic elements that were part of survival mode in Fallout 4 built into the base game in Fallout 76. Things like thirst and hunger and fatigue, etc. And there might be a camping element as well. Like, instead of just finding a chair and sitting in it to wait out time, you might have a campsite option in order to rest or pass the time. Kind of like they did in the uh, last couple of Tomb Raider games. Next, we have a little army man, which actually looks like MacReady's toy soldier from Fallout 4. Now, MacReady wasn't born for another 150 years or something, but it may be an indication of another soldier-style companion. There are also a couple of new vehicles, a Jeep and a motorcycle. There was some unusable motorcycles seen in Fallout 4, but I don't think we've seen a Jeep. Now this is a leap, but this might be an indication of usable vehicles in Fallout 76. That's something we've never seen before. Since this is a prequel, there might be still some gasoline left to scavenge in the wasteland. Now that would be a big step for a Fallout game. Plenty of other games have been featuring drivable vehicles in their open world games for years. Bethesda may finally be stepping up to the plate with that, you know? You never know. Next we have a UFO toy model. That's new. Not UFOs, but the model. However, I think this might be a clue that there's going to be a notable alien element to this game. I'm going to give you some interesting information about that, so you'll want to stick around to the end of the video. But let's move on to the TV. Now, I already covered my notion about the colorized TV earlier, but let's hear what the announcer says. For when the fighting is stopped and the fallout is settled, you must rebuild. When the fighting has stopped and the fallout has settled, you must rebuild. This was the biggest clue for me that settlement building is not only going to be included in the game, but even a significant part of it. And as you guys can imagine, I could not be happier about that. I want you to take note of one interesting thing in the TV shot, though. Notice the yellow balloons? Make a mental note of that, and we'll talk about that more later. Oh, and before we go to the next shot, let me know what you guys think about this. It looks like possibly a butter churn to me, but you guys may have a better idea. Okay, in the next scene, we see a bunch of awards in a display case. But before we get into what they say, I'm hoping that display case is a buildable item in the game that transferring objects into will line them up perfectly on the shelf without any chance of them falling over or glitching through. But that's just a wish list item. Okay, let's take a look at what each says. Best looking hair. To me, that's an indication that character customization is back and maybe even better than Fallout 4. By the way, these are all my theories, of course. Some of it may be wishful thinking, but I'm calling them educated guesses. <laughs> Cleanest toilet award. Firstly, that's hilarious. We know that Bethesda didn't script on their humor in this game. Secondly, to me, this is an indication that the building system might give us the option of both a scrappy look and a clean look for building utility items, which was always a huge pet peeve for me in Fallout 4. I mean, that bathtub, am I right? Next one says, performance award, vault hall monitor in recognition of loyal and dedicated service towards the order and safety of our community. I'm actually going to come back to this one later, and I have an important theory about this, so hang in there. As well as the next one, which says, Outstanding Achievement Award in appreciation for your commitment and dedication to our isolation program. Sacrificing many so some can live. Next one says, Excellence and Bravery in recognition of the canned mystery meat experiment. You volunteered to eat when no one else would. We are proud of you and glad you're not dead. <laughs> so this one adds more humor, but it might also be a hint at either a cannibalism situation perpetrated by vault -Tec or a possible clue to a side quest. I don't have enough information to go on, so we'll keep moving. Lastly, annual Vault Halloween costume contest, first place. Not sure what to take away from that other than just a clue that the clothing system in the game will probably be robust. You know, maybe there might be possibility for more body slots for stat boosting items, which would be very cool. I couldn't tell what that painting was on the right wall. Even running it through a bunch of filters, it was just too blurry. So moving on to the next shot, mostly mundane items in the laundry room. Mason jars look new, as well as a, a creepy cat doll. Could be a nod to Sonic the Hedgehog, though. But let's not overlook the possibility that the washer and dryer might be buildable settlement items, which would be awesome for us builders. The vault Tech poster on the wall says this. Now, hermetics is an interesting word choice here. The implication is that something is being hermetically sealed for preservation. Maybe vault Tech didn't want to use more alarmist words like quarantine or sequester. I'm not going to read too much further into it than that, though. Notice the toilet paper, though. Another possible new junk item, as well as a bunch of stuff in this bathroom that I hope is craftable in sediment building. The bird decoration on the toilet is probably a wren or a warbler, both types of birds commonly found in West Virginia. We might see them flying around instead of the crows that we see in Fallout 4. 
Same with the owl in this shot, probably a type of owl common to West Virginia called a saw wet. The rest of the items in this shot look pretty standard except for three things that I noticed. One, the computers look slightly different than the models in previous games. A more gradual shift towards what they look like in the 1970s, specifically a model called ADM-3A, which interestingly enough went on sale in 1976. Also, the pen plaque is barely readable, but it says Lure of the Year. I'm going to assume that says Dweller of the Year. So it's pretty clear that the protagonist was an upstanding citizen. That's good. We want our guy or gal to be a hero. But I'm still thinking there's going to be a tragedy revenge story arc, you know, where the guy goes all Liam Neeson from Taken on the bad guys, you know. You know don't even try and be rushing around Liam Neeson. He'll take your arm out. <laughs> Finally, the terminal is flashing an Evite kind of thing. Now, I don't want to read too much into that because they could just be setting up the upcoming Reclamation Day shot, but it seems like he would have cleared that off his terminal if it happened a while ago. But we'll get to more of that in a moment. Oh, and there's a very brief glimpse of some kind of chubby clown decoration. Can't see enough of it to form any theory, but we'll probably see some story behind it in the game. Next shot, kitchenette, new lamps, cool, hope they're buildable. The only thing that really stood out to me, well, two things actually. One, there's a little attachment to the pencil here. I forget what those things are called, you know, those classic pencil toppers. Let me know down below if you know what I'm talking about. The other thing was the uh, decoration on the drinking glass. At first, it looked like a mouse, you know, like Bullwinkle or something. But when I zoomed in, I realized it was actually a lobster. Another possible indication of some underwater action, although probably that would be in the Chesapeake Bay. Now the atrium shot, a few more interesting potential buildable items here. Fingers crossed on that. Quite interesting that there's an indoor sports field. That would also be fascinating if those were buildable. Could even be justification for providing AstroTurf as a possible, you know, outdoor building element to make it look like your settlement has green grass. But let's talk about the concept of Reclamation Day here. So the word reclamation is also an interesting choice of words. In real life, when reclamation is used, it's usually used in the context of filling water damaged areas with earth, like in the case of erosion. In this context, it's clearly being used in the sense of reclaiming the land from nuclear war damage. So this tells me I can feel pretty confident that there's going to be a robust settlement building element to the game. But what is actually going on in this scene? There's no people. And they could have just chose not to animate a big crowd scene because of uh, animation capacity issues. Maybe they didn't want anything to stutter, you know, before the game came out. That would be bad form. But more likely, there's a story element involved here. Now, we can tell the celebration was probably not too long ago because most of the balloons are still floating. Now, unless they have some kind of special helium mixture in the vaults, balloons usually stop floating within a day after they've been filled. So there's one of two things going on here. Either Bethesda didn't think about the science behind that and just wanted to feature a celebratory scene with floating balloons, or more likely that the party happened today or yesterday and all the people have already left the vault except for the protagonist. Now we saw the date on the Pip-Boy as 2102, which according to lore is five years after the vault should have opened. So there's some kind of discrepancy going on here. Party just happened, balloons are still floating, nothing has been cleaned up yet, food items still look relatively fresh. So you ready for my theory? All right, here goes. I think the protagonist is either a security guard in the vault or a recon scout, or both. In the trophy case, we saw he won an award for being a hall monitor. He got the award for his loyalty and dedicated service towards the order and safety of the community. Also, take a look at the next shot. His vault suit doesn't look like standard issue. It's got kind of a cop vibe to me, you know? Arm padding, something that looks like a utility belt. I think cops call it a police duty belt. And then notice this thing. Hard to tell what it is from the front, but look at the next shot. That black line down his back isn't just weird stitching. To me, it looks like a cable that is running up his back, over his shoulder, and down to what I think is a radio mic. You've probably seen cops with those shoulder-mounted radios. So I'm swinging out of the park here, but this is my theory. Remember that thing under the bed that I said was a walkie-talkie? Well, you wouldn't exactly be able to hold a rifle and use the walkie-talkie at the same time, you know, you only have two hands. So I'm thinking that you mount the walkie-talkie on your belt and then you can transmit hands-free through the shoulder mic to your companions or squad mates. <laughs> Look, don't skewer me guys if I'm wrong about this. I'm just having fun with you here because we're all excited about the game. But I do feel like that's a pretty sound guess. Also, my theory about him being a security guard or a recon scout is further reinforced by the fact that the backpack we saw earlier is a bit dirty on his bed 
and there are some rads accumulated on the pit boy. That tells me he scouted ahead, got a little dirty, picked up some rads. Also, remember I said I'd come back to that one award about the isolation program? A lot of people are thinking that means he was isolated in the vault, like he was put into solitary confinement maybe to preserve resources. However, I'm thinking the opposite. I think he was isolated outside of the vault. I'm really putting myself out here with this, but to sum it up, here's what I think happened. I think the vault opened five years ago, but the vault dwellers didn't celebrate Reclamation Day at that point. I think they sent out the protagonist as either a security guard or a recon scout to make sure the surrounding area was safe before the normals made their way out into the wasteland. I mean, that would make sense. Look at the people on the TV. They're all wearing suits and dresses. Not exactly prepared for mutants and raiders. So, I think the story may start the day after they officially declared the surrounding area safe for civilians and celebrated the start of their new lives. Okay, now let's turn to the last section of the video, and that's some interesting things we might encounter in the game and the explorable area. Now, there's not a whole lot going on in West Virginia, to be honest. Not like if the game took place in New York or San Francisco. But there are a few landmarks and phenomena that could be quite interesting. First of all, if my theory is correct about the Panhandle area, then the major road we'll probably see on the map is Interstate 81. Then Highway 50 would take us into the Capital Wasteland. There's a real-life luxury hotel in West Virginia called the Greenbrier. Underneath the hotel is a huge underground bunker that was meant to house top government officials during the Cold War in the event of a catastrophic emergency. They called it Project Greek Island. Basically, it's a continuity of government bomb shelter. Most likely, it'll be part of a mission, kind of like the DIA switchboard facility in Fallout 4. And speaking of Fallout 4, I remembered there was a tiny reference to the Greenbrier in the game. It's a radio tower that I was going to make a video about, but never got around to it. I have so much archived Fallout 4 footage that I've never made into a video. It's just a shame. But anyway, Bethesda likes to plant seeds in their games for future lore references. So I have no doubt the Greenbrier will be one of the explorable areas in the game. If not, not, that would be a huge missed opportunity. Now, about 10 miles away from the Greenbrier is a place called Organ Cave. It's one of the largest cave systems in the state, and it has a spooky name, so I can imagine it being an explorable area. And speaking of caves with spooky names, there's an area called Lost World Caverns near Lewisburg, West Virginia. That would be perfect for exploration. Even the name invites video game exploration. Lost World Caverns. <laughs> Same with another cave system called the Hell Hole. That's literally the name of the cave. I mean, with all these creepy sounding cave names, I have no doubt that spelunking will be a facet of the game. And continuing with the spooky vibe, there's an abandoned insane asylum in West Virginia called the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. It closed down in the 1990s and is now regarded as one of the most haunted insane asylums in America. Now they might change the name like the way they changed the Danvers Insane Asylum and follow it forward to the Parsons Insane Asylum. But I can't imagine them not including that. There's a huge Native American burial ground near the Ohio River Valley in West Virginia called the Grave Creek Mound. Now, they may not include that for political sensitivity issues. You know, they wouldn't want you desecrating that area even in a video game, but it could be a landmark in some form nonetheless. And on the topic of religious sites, there's a Hare Krishna Palace of Gold in West Virginia. They would undoubtedly change the name of that place, but it might be a headquarters to a local faction of the game or maybe the Children of Adam. Another possible landmark is the NRAO, which stands for the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia. I'm imagining at least a side quest taking place there because it's much bigger than the Revere Satellite Array south of Finch Farm. We're talking about it's the world's second largest radio telescope. So unless it got damaged and fell over, we're going to see it somewhere on the map in the distance. Now, if nearby parts of Virginia are to be included in the map region, there's an interesting area that might show up in the game called Mount Weather. If you're a fan of the show The 100, then you might remember that as one of the important important plot locations. I watched that show, it's kind of cool. Anyway, it's a FEMA facility and no doubt has a bunker vault system. And if parts of Pennsylvania are to be included in the map region as well, there's a similar facility called the Raven Rock Complex. Now these states all border on each other, so it's not unreasonable to assume that if the map was centered on the intersection of these states, that all these landmarks might be included. Now let's look at some of the phenomena I mentioned. Have any of you ever seen the movie The Mothman Prophecies with Richard Gere? Well, that was based on a real-life series of paranormal events that took place in West Virginia. In an area called Point Pleasant, a humanoid moth creature haunted the area during the late 60s and early 70s. 
Plus, Point Pleasant has such a fallout sounding name, doesn't it? Another huge missed opportunity if they don't incorporate that into the game somehow. I would even be happy with a related side quest. And speaking of mysterious West Virginia folklore, there's also a creature called the Flatwoods Monster that reportedly haunted the town of Flatwoods, West Virginia in the 1950s. They called it the Phantom of Flatwoods. Some think it may have been an alien though. And speaking of aliens, do you remember earlier when I said to make a mental note about the alien ship? Well, if parts of nearby Pennsylvania might be included in the map region, then just barely north of the West Virginia border is an area called Kecksburg. Besides Roswell, Kecksburg is the most famous alleged UFO crash site in the United States. There's also reference in Fallout lore to a crash site in an area of Virginia just north of the West Virginia border called Hagerstown. Supposedly an alien ship crashed called the Palandine. So that might get its due in this game. So if you combine all that with the alien ship model in the autopsy game in the trailer, I think aliens might make the biggest Fallout comeback since Mothership Zeta. In fact, in that DLC, a reference is made to Vault 76 by an executive from Vault Tech who was abducted by aliens while inspecting Vault 76. So, I think we'll see aliens play a big part in the game, or maybe another DLC centered around them. And how cool would that be if you finished an alien-related quest and then were able to build alien items in the settlement building system? Then my UFO over Somerville Place could be completely lore-friendly. Lastly, there's an area in northern West Virginia called the Cranesville Swamp Preserve. If we see any swampy areas in the game, that's most likely where they'll be. And I bring that up because it reminds me of the Swamp Folk from the Point Lookout DLC in Fallout 3. The Swamp Folk were kind of inbred looking clod hoppers that I think will make a comeback in this game. If they're not called swamp folk, then they might be called hill folk or mountain folk. But I would be highly surprised if there wasn't some form of hostile hillbillies in the game given the setting and the rural vibe that I'm picking up. I also mentioned earlier that West Virginia is coal country. I think we're definitely going to be exploring some abandoned coal mines. One in particular that looks a bit like that painting in the trailer I mentioned is a place called Nuttleburg. Now how cool would that be to ride mine carts or down rickety elevators in the game? Okay, let's quickly move to the last section of the video before my voice dies. Here are my evolved meta theories about the game itself. First of all, I'll just say this. I have serious doubts that this game will be a strictly multiplayer or MMO game. Their previous rollouts for such things like Elder Scrolls Online were not hyped like this. If they restricted solo campaigning, they would be seriously shooting themselves in the foot. And I think they're keenly aware that single player gaming is their bread and butter. Why do I say that? Does anyone remember a short film they put out back in December called Save Player One? I don't know if it's safe to include any of that footage. You know, I put so much work into this video, I don't want it to get flagged, but just look up Bethesda Player One on YouTube and you'll see a cute little video they put out starring Linda Carter. Now, most people thought that was a bit of clever advertising for their previous single player games. In hindsight, I think that was actually a damage control effort to head off leaks about Fallout 76 being a Rust clone because someone with inside knowledge did leak word of Fallout 76 on 4chan. No one really believed that person at the time because, you know, Fallout 76. But how would that person know the name of the game way back in December unless they had inside knowledge? So, I think Bethesda kind of got panicked and put out that Save Player One video in response to that leak, and in case any more came after that, you know, stepping on their bread and butter. Therefore, I'm pretty sure that single player campaigning will be one of the options in the game, with that idea of the Far Cry 5 co-op companions idea that I mentioned earlier. Now, as for the release date, that's a tough one. We'll probably know in a day or two, but I would be highly doubtful of a summer release. The Amazon pre-order has changed to December 31st, 2019, which is a Tuesday. Now that might be just a placeholder, but remember how I said we'd come back to the date on the Pip-Boy? Well, if we were to theorize that October 27 might be a clue to the release date, then when would October 27 fall on a Tuesday? Well, it doesn't fall on a Tuesday until 2020. It is very, very rare that games are released on days other than Tuesdays because that's become a standard in the industry going back to the late 80s and early 1990s. Now, sometimes huge AAA titles can break the rules a little and get away with a Friday release, but that's rare. However, October 27 of this year falls on a Saturday. No game is going to drop on a Saturday. So, either the date on the Pip-Boy is no reference at all to the release date, and they release it this year on another day, or we might have to wait until 2020. Now, they did announce Fallout 4 in the summer of 2015 and then released it in the fall. So, that's probably going to happen this time, too. But it just makes me wonder why they chose that particular date to show so prominently on the Pip-Boy. You know what I mean? I guess it may be a story element that we'll learn as the game commences. Anyway, guys, if you stuck around to the end of this video, I hope I was able to give you some interesting insights and entertain you a little in the process. I'm going to go like sleep for the whole weekend, you know, 
and also watch your awesome settlement contest submissions. Depending on what they announce at E3, I might put out a follow-up video. So sub if you want to be kept up on all things Fallout and throw a like on the video. Thanks so much for watching, guys. See you next time and peace out.